I'm at Cardiff today. It's uh, pretty horrible. But uh, the good news is we're going to do an interview with filmmaker Tom Swindell, who's doing in a workshop at the uni. Then we're going to do some filming for a documentary. So let's go and have a nosy. Well, yeah, I came to Cardiff recently to do a shoot for Channel 5 for a documentary about hate crime and we needed a studio to film in. The studios are expensive and amazingly there's sometimes really limited budgets for TV documentaries. So um, I suggested to the producer that we contact um, a friend of mine who teaches in Cardiff University uh, or University of South Wales as it's now called to see if we could access their studio. So they said yes. So we got to use their studio for the television programme but I obviously because it's a university, I wanted to give back to the students. So I ran a little workshop based around the subject of what we call, you know, say a master interview. It's normally referred to as a master interview, which would be often the spine of a documentary. It's that big sit down chat that you have with your contributors, your key contributors. There's been many elements to my work over the years and there's been a few kind of niches that I've worked in or developed. And one of the things I keep getting called back for is to shoot master interviews. That's mainly to do with the lighting. That's why they're hiring a DOP, because they know that you need controlled lighting um, and they know they want to get good quality sound as well. So they often refer to a DOP for that kind of thing. It's also because the director, it's very beneficial if they can sit to the side of the camera and be able to look the contributor directly in the eye and engage with them as a you know, person to person. You know, the alternative to, the, to that would be like a self-shooting producer director who would always be kind of stuck behind the, the clunky big camera and, you know, every now and again looking at their settings and then looking back to the contributor and then thinking the questions. It's, that's done a lot in documentaries, but when it comes to getting deep testimony out of people, they, uh, they go for the master interview. So, yeah, it's a kind of something I've developed or, you know, kind of perfected in, in my own little way. But it's taken me years to kind of find these little nuances to create a beautiful looking talking head. But a lot of that stuff can be taught relatively quickly and you know, what might have taken me years to develop because I had no mentors, I had no elders, no other cameramen or DOPs to look up to. So I had to really just learn it myself through trial and tribulation, you know, on TV programs. <laughs> I just decided I was a documentary filmmaker and started making documentaries on my own with mainly a handy camera. Sometimes I could borrow a PD-150 off a friend of mine and then I'd edit them myself on like a very early version of Premiere at home on a PC. I did a trip to Jamaica in 2004 with my handy cam and um, at one point during the trip we got to Studio One which is the first, as you can tell, Studio One first proper recording studio in Jamaica. So there's a guy called Cox and Dodd who runs it and he put out My Gill Lollipop and the first ever kind of, you know, ska and mento and reggae music. So he's a serious guy of massive cultural importance. And uh, me and my friend, um, my Rasta man friend from Cardiff walked into there to his office and kind of said, hey, you know, can we do a little interview? And he kind of looked at me, he looked at my handy cam and he said, you know, get away boy or something like that, you know, kind of get get out of my place to us, called me a boy. And I remember going out of there and flying home to Wales at the time where I lived. And uh, two weeks later, he died. So at that point, I thought, Do you know what? I need to like sort my act out. I need to kind of become more professional. I need to, like, how, how come I didn't, how come he didn't give me that interview? What can I do to, to learn more? There was another moment where I went into Butte Town History uh, and Arts Centre and uh, I was walking around the room and I got introduced to someone and uh, I shook his hand. I said, hello, my name's Tom Swindell. I'm a documentary filmmaker. And the guy had a big grey beard and tall, smart looking guy in a suit in this art centre. He looked down and he said, really? Where did you study? And I was like, mm -hmm. what do you mean, where did you study? Like, I'm a documentary filmmaker. We're in a different world now. Now is a world of do-it-yourself, DIY, filmmaking, YouTube. You can get millions of views. But back then, there was a system, and it was either an apprenticeship-type system or academic system. 
So at the time there was a documentary BA course had just started a couple of years before in Newport in South Wales. You had to do like an MA and specialise in documentary. You couldn't really do documentary at BA. So this is the first course of its kind. So I decided to study documentary, which did give me a great foundation. Well, I was more of a director at that point, making my own films. And then after that, I decided to become a DOP when I went out into the real world of employment. How I got my first break was kind of interesting. Um, I think a lot of people have got similar stories to this. You know, I think a lot of people get their first break because some other guy was ill. So there's a catch-22 when it comes to the media industry. Um, at that time, BBC were all the rage, so you couldn't get a job at the BBC if you hadn't had a job at the BBC. You know, that was just how it was. So it's a catch-22, it's kind of impossible. You had to know someone in there, and I didn't know anybody. But through doing this degree, I met the teacher, who, the lecturer, who was, of course, an ex-BBC filmmaker. And um, in the third year, he started to make a BBC Wales programme, and the DOP was already on a shoot in Tunisia, and there was a sandstorm. So this big sandstorm came up and kind of ruined their shoot, and they had to extend their shoot for another two weeks. There was an American contributor. It was about this American artist who was doing this thing in Aberfan in the valleys where there was a big disaster in the 60s, a mining disaster that killed a lot of children in the school. Yeah. The teacher said, Tom, can you come and cover for this DOP? Because um, I was his best student in terms of camera department, so he chose me to come up and cover for the other DOP. So I did the first two weeks filming on that program. Um, that went on to win like a Welsh BAFTA and stuff like that and did quite well. So that got me my first foot in the door. After getting a little bit of success with Welsh television, I really wanted to be part of the national television network. So. Um, I'd heard through my lecture that there was this festival, a uh, film festival called Sheffield Documentary Film Festival. So I started traveling up to Sheffield to that. And I went there with a kind of hustler mentality of um, I brought my laptop with me. And in those times, the only way you could share a film with someone because you couldn't upload it to YouTube so easily um, would be to make a DVD. So I just used to burn off DVDs uh, as many as I could. I remember sitting in the back of a film screening whilst meant to be watching someone else's documentary and I'm like, you know, because it would take like 10 minutes to burn each DVD. Mm -hmm. I was burning as many as I could of my student work. I'd kind of heard this phrase like, you know, you have to know someone to get into the industry. So I, I realised I didn't know anybody. So I thought I'd change that phrase to it's rather than it's who you know, it's who you meet. So I started to be a bit active at the film festival. I'd walk up to like Molly Deneen and famous filmmakers like her and try and give her a DVD. She'd be like, oh, thank you, and put it in a bag and mm. probably throw it away and never watch it. So, you know, I must have given out 50 DVDs, but um, I gave one to a guy called Patrick Uden who worked at Channel 4. And Patrick Uden, someone who's always been interested in new talent in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, there's a lot of people who can go back to Patrick Uden and say that he was the guy who really gave them the first foot into the industry. He just got an eye for talent and a kind of a faith in young people that maybe some other people in the industry didn't have. At that time, it was early days of YouTube, so 2007, I think 2006 and 2007. Mm. So I was uploading a lot and being very successful at that point, getting put on the YouTube's main page worldwide. Patrick Uden after a few YouTube's go, YouTube videos going up and after about six months passed, he said, Tom, I think I've got a job for you. I'd like you to come and see me. So he invited me down to London and I went to the television center and I was walking around the huge building. I could see, oh, that's where Blue Peter was, was made. That's where the news is made. You know, mm -hmm. It was amazing for me um, as a young man to be, I think I was 25 or 26 at the time, um, to be in that big building. And I was having meetings about being the director of the title se sequence of a, a prime time documentary series called The Restaurant with Raymond Blanc, a kind of celebrity chef. So yeah, I was thrown in there as a director of this stylized intros to programs with kind of pre-title sequences. Being handed keys to your own restaurant is an opportunity few people get. Once again, legendary chef Raymond Blanc is offering nine couples that chance. And I also got into doing this thing called interstitials. So it would be, say, if you've got a scene in a restaurant in Oxford and then you want to cut to the restaurant in Newcastle, 
you cut to the wide of the building outside and you know a little car zipping past a shot of a sign saying Liverpool or Newcastle and then you know a little close-up of a fork being lifted that type of thing so I became the the guy who's making the glue that would stitch scenes together so editors absolutely loved me because I had great compositional skills and the main people who were filming the programs were PDs with Canon 305s, not very good cameras. And um, they were more intellectuals who were after the story. And, you know, they didn't have the inclination or time or willing to notice a bit of light coming through a window and think, oh, I'll set up a little champagne glass there and pour a drink and, you know, make get a nice shot. So I was effectively bringing the kind of pack shot advertising style aesthetic to a TV documentary series and kind of raising the bar. And um, they had a rap party because back then there was just like money around in the industry. The, it was just as 2008 crash was just starting to happen, but the, you know, the budgets were already in place. At the end, they got up on a stage and they said, look, we can't mention any names because there's far too many people here, but I'd like Tom Swindell to come up. And I was like, oh my God, I came up. and. I'd been bullied by some of the other camera guys on there. They would call me Mickey Mouse and said, oh, you you stupid little camera. Cause I had like a small Sony Z1 and they all use big digi beaters. So yeah. they kind of, it was kind of, you could call it banter, but I found it a bit bullying being like a Welsh guy. Yeah. And then suddenly in this scene with these big English guys who were very much, you know, drive big estate cars, got nice big houses, big cameras, you know, they were from a different world to me. Um, but I kind of snuck around them, hid under tables, you know, found ways to not get in their way, still managed to get my shots. I was a B-roll guy. Yeah, I was getting this killer B-roll and my name went around like wildfire. So what was good is the first series I got into was a major thing. You'd have, say, eight PDs and eight sound men all in these groups. It would be the same as The Apprentice. You have the kind of big groups of... Um, you know, one would be based in Newcastle, one would be in Bristol, wherever the different uh, restaurants are. So there might have been eight editors on that programme and all of the editors got to know my footage. All of the producer directors got to know my footage. Some of the sound people got to know my footage. So that just created this kind of tree of life. And from that, I would start to get these phone calls. And at that point, I kind of retired in the sense of trying to get work. And that was in 2009. And since then, the phone would just ring. And um, I don't do anything really, I just relax at home and I get emails or phone calls from people who have heard about me from personal recommendations. But um, as with anything in life, what goes up must come down, you know? And um, I think I'd say I hit a bit of a peak of my career as in the amount that I was working is now tailing off. But there can be many reasons maybe I'm not pushing it myself enough or there's technological changes. For example, I was this guy who was creating these beautiful images that really punctuated not so beautiful camera work from PDs or even self-shooting APs at that yeah. time. And now we have cameras like the FS7 out there, the C300 out there, suddenly using prime lenses is kind of normal. Directors are kind of getting into that kind of thing and they're doing a nice sit down interview with a 50 mil before they'd have to call someone like me to do that because the director's cameras couldn't take those lenses and they didn't know how to use the complicated kind of adapters and stuff that I would use to get those lenses on my cameras at the time. So the documentary world is really a world of the self shooting director. It's a high shooting ratio being that P PD um, yeah. is all the asking questions. It's basically not, focused around aesthetics enough to stimulate me. I'm really about, maybe not pretty pictures, but just interesting pictures and compositions. Before I was a student, I had a Sony Handy camera. Um, I called myself No Tripod Productions because I thought the tripods for, were for like old guys who were tired. And I was all about this kind of handheld dynamic stuff. And, um, you know, I was a skateboarder at the time and there was a lot of kind of like skate films with like the independent, little movies that were being made that we could kind of relate to and think, oh, we could do something like that. Um, so I used to take the camera and turn it upside down because the lens was very much at the top of the camera. So I get really extreme shots like over rivers and that kind of thing, almost kind of nearly dipping it into the water and just off the edge of skateboards and that kind of thing. 
which now is so normally just like clip a GoPro on underneath a skateboard and get a shot right next to the wheel. But at the time it was a more unusual, quite fresh thing because, um, you know, cameras were very big, you know, they were digibeta at that time. Um, I didn't really get into tripod until I was forced to at, at the BBC. Uh, so when I first worked for the BBC and I was working directly for the BBC, it wasn't a production company, it was, it was in-house. Um, and uh, on the series called The Restaurant, I was asked to use a tripod and I loved it. I suddenly got really into it because I got really into my compositions and I'd be like, no, there's a little white speck in the corner. I'm just going to move it over a little bit. And I'd be really careful about how the lines and the uh, line, how the compositional lines kind of came together. Th there was a few rules that were given to me. Like I wasn't allowed to do pans. I wasn't allowed to do tilts. Because if you start a pan, it dictates to the editor how long the shot is. The pan starts there and it comes over and reveals. If you've done a pan at two seconds, the, the editor's got to use it for two seconds. If you've done a slow pan for eight seconds, they've got an eight second shot. And often in television, they, you know, they need to play about with the length of the shot. So instead I started getting into focus pulls. So I do quick focus pulls, slow focus pulls, and you know, the editor could kind of choose which part he wanted to use. So the BBC kind of changed my style and I kind of came onto tripod and I worked with focus pulls a lot and I worked with depth a lot. So I'd film many layers. So I'd film like a steaming pot that was, you know, has boiling carrots in it or something. You can see the steam coming off the top of it. That was lit by, say, like a little kitchen window there. And then there'd be another layer. You could see another room in the background with chefs milling around and then another layer with an open door at the back with light spilling into it. So, yeah, I developed a um, certain style. And, um, and then my style's changed over the years. Um, another point where I noticed the style changing was when the Canon 5D came out and I started to do more music videos. I, I was frustrated with the work I'd done at BBC and I felt there was a bit um, kind of like, a, you know, not flexible, kind of like on the tripod slow. And it had this new perspective because it had the kind of POV, because I'd bring it up to my eye and I'd film like that, like that instead of filming on my shoulder or filming the handy cam you never really brought to your eye. It was always like filming from the hip. So, the kind of POV thing became a bit of a style for me at that point, around 2012, 2013. Another cool thing I used to do with the Canon 5D was physically throw it and catch it. I'd hold it, hit record, have a nice wide lens, like a 14 mil, I flip the camera and catch it. So you get this kind of spiraling tumble shot. And if you did that at different locations, you could cut together those two different shots. So I think different cameras, different equipment inform different styles and it's, it's nice how my style's changed o over the years. Sometimes I suddenly dip back into an old style, an old, old approach. For example, recently in the last year, I brought a lens from Fusion on that's a 50 to 135 millimeter and it's not great handheld. There's no image stabilization in it. There's no image stabilization in the FS7 and it not being the heaviest weighted camera it just means that it's just a little bit ropey, especially on the longer end of the lens. Um, so that's pushed me back onto the tripod again. But even if you are using a tripod, there may be ways to kind of still give it a different dynamic. So I'm quite nervous about the normal height of a tripod. I try not to do that. So I've got a specialist tripod from Satchler called the Zoom System, Zoom with an S. And it goes very high, like two meters high. And um, it also has mini legs, so it'll go just kind of like two foot or one foot off the floor. So I tend to use those really extreme things like the big high shot can be quite nice because it feels like a CCTV or you can be in the middle of a field and suddenly have this higher kind of shot, a bit like a kind of a jib would. I really ditched the tripod heavily at a certain point, which was probably around 2014 when I started working for Vice because Vice's style was spontaneous was the word that they were looking for. Um, so I couldn't sit someone down for a master interview and put loads of careful lights on there and take ages of setting up. They didn't like that. They much preferred me to be walking around while someone's doing some gardening and just pop them a quick question. So it never felt like a kind of official sit down interview. That wasn't their style. So because of that, I stopped using tripods and I really got heavily into handheld and I didn't touch the tripod for a long time.
So, yeah, it's enjoyable how it kind of things come and go and come back. For me, there's a rationale behind all of those choices. Like a, a tripod says something, it communicates a very particular thing as opposed to a handheld. Um, in a lot of my personal films for a long time, I wouldn't do any interviews on tripod at all because I just felt that we never sit completely stiff like this as humans were always kind of moving about a little bit so I would break my back like insane like doing like 45 minutes mm. handheld interviews nearly dying because handheld's okay but being staying stiff in one position for a long time is a lot just to get that slight wobble so I'll suffer for the art you know because for me there's a kind of a, there's a real meaning behind that handheld it gives it this human mm -hmm. um, lively feel for me, like photography and then film, is you know its root is is the human experience of sight and eyesight. So I always go back to how we use our eyes and the kind of things we can do with our eyes. Cameras can do things that we can't do with our eyes, right? So for one example, would be zooming. Human's eye doesn't have the ability to zoom. It can kind of concentrate a focus in the distance or in a small narrow plane, but you can't zoom. So all rules are there to be broken. I'm not saying that this is a standard rule or anything, but you know that might be a rationale why a lot of people avoid zooms these days, why they're out of fashion, because it's not a naturally occurring thing. Now, the gimbal, again, it can be a bit too perfect. We don't really float down the street. It is what it is. It's a robot. It is, it is free motors. It is non-human. It's non-animal. It's got a certain feel and you don't always want that feel because to be like floating down the street or perfectly is not it's something I, I'm not that obsessed with I don't own a Mavi or don't ever really push for that type of work but I have done it a few times because I get asked to do it so I always say yes and give it a go and I own a small gimbal but I, I don't always follow fashion if there's a big hype or everyone's doing a certain thing in the industry I might do something else just to represent another side of things. Like I, I'm a boss with the handheld work and it's, it's, it's a deep intuitive thing about having eyes on the back of your head, listening and knowing, you know, how to be in social situations from 12 years of experience doing broadcast documentaries. The gimbal can't always react and be ready as much as a handheld human can, I mean, Interesting example would be the carnivals in Trinidad. I've brought steady cams there, gimbals there, you know, you name it, every type of stabilization you could think of. And after all the experiment and in seven years of filming carnivals, I actually find small handheld camera with a wide lens that when you're going through a crowd and you need to suddenly be small, you can crunch it up there and you can squeeze through. Try getting through. 30,000 people with a steady cam. you know, you can do it, I've done it during carnival, but you know, you have to hire security guards and people like that to push people out of the way so you can get through. Started with a Sony handy camera. Um, I never really let go of those routes. There's a lot of, I don't care anymore, but there was times, man, where you have a lot of anxiety, like, oh, should I buy a red, should I this, should I that? I love the shots that a small camera allows you to get, such as, sticking a camera in a microwave or sticking a camera in a washing machine. I am an angles guy. I was, I, back in the day, I was just trying to make it and there were these big digibeater guys and they were doing wide, mid, tight. Change, wide, mid, tight, walk to the other side of the room, wide, mid, tight. All from this perspective, from the shoulder. So I was trying to get away from that. So I was going low, I was going high. I did what I had to do to survive uh, in the kind of competitive industry. And for me, uh, I don't want to call them weird, but alternative angles which is my thing. I'd be down on the table surface looking, you know, just underneath the plate or something like, like, like that, up into the, up into a fan on the ceiling or something, you know, just looking underneath a plate and up to the ceiling in one shot and then a chef walks past, yeah. rather than just filming the chef walk past on the standard height. Perhaps I failed in the last few years because I didn't go with the trend 
I mean, the trend is uh, Arri Mini or Red, take out a loan, buy those big cameras, get yourself a Mavi Pro, get yourself an easy rig and your follow focus. Yeah, it might give this amazing look for branded content and you're filming some celebrity boxer or something, but you can't even fit through the door because you're gonna bash your head on the wire. For me, it's the, the excitement's not really about doing like branded content with a celebrity who's there for one hour or something in a sports stadium in East London. Yeah. For me, the exciting part of the filmmaking work is to be in Rio de Janeiro in the favela, you know, with guys making music or something and, you know, you don't know what's going to pop off at that point. You've got the small camera handheld on the shoulder. You're ready to duck out of there to go if you need to go jump in the taxi. I mean, like, it's just a kind of smaller, lighter um, camera setup and it's and it's kind of based in, like, reality. To me, the Mavi thing, it's based in this kind of dream world of, like, advertising and everything looking smooth mm. and I, di I didn't grow up with that when I was growing up the concept of things being smooth wasn't cool to us smooth was was like Elvis smooth was like Frank Sinatra you know mm -hmm, smooth singing and that's like what the movie is like to me it's like this smooth perfection machine we were into like punk we liked the Sex Pistols we liked Lagwagon and all these kind of American punk bands and and that was about, you know, sometimes just putting a mic in a room and recording the band in a garage rather than even layering up the musicians properly because it had a different Raw. sound or a different rawness to it. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm a bit suspicious of overly using the Movi and that type of thing. Travel's a big part of the job. That was why I wanted the job. I did avoid the... Um, Iraq and places like that where they've asked me to go but yeah definitely the my kidnappers meeting kidnappers and terrorists known terrorists in Colombia who had literally kidnapped people yeah. so that that's definitely got a danger point to it um, or even just be you know being on the side of a mountain in the Andes a snow ice mountain I mean you know you fall off there it's just you're, you're not yeah. come back yeah. I'm like first millennial in a sense of I was literally about 18 around the year or 16 I think around the year 2000 so I was coming of age around that time um, and a lot of people were starting then to start the traveling thing and starting to go to Thailand and those kind of places so it was around you could meet people who'd been to Asia and things like that and um, that was kind of perking up my ears a little bit to meet some older people who'd been abroad and then I watched Baraka which was the big thing for me. This is when I was 16 um, and uh, I didn't know what to do in my life. Um, I was a photographer, I was into music, but I hadn't really put the two and two together. Yeah, I was sat down in a class at 16 years old, having hardly been anywhere. I'd literally just lived in one part of Wales my whole life. Suddenly I was, my mind was blown because I was shown the world through this film, Baraka, that had scenes from Morocco, Nepal, Japan, Cape Verde Islands. It literally, I think they went to like 15 or 20 countries or something to make that film. So that literally showed me the world um, in a way that you no know, other film would. So that gave me the bug big time. And also, I'm from Cardiff Docks area and that has got a lot of people from around the world. So I guess growing up, I, w I was meeting people from Jamaica, people from West Africa, people from Bangladesh, people from China. You know, I was growing up with those people and I would be asking them questions about their culture, about their family's culture, about the original countries that their, their origin came from. So I started to, I was always inquisitive about other countries. It's not exactly a fake it till you make it, but I would say you do have to speculate to accumulate. So I was at a party one time and someone said, oh, my cousin from Manchester is getting married to a guy from the Gambia and they're gonna have a wedding out there. So I was like, okay, I've got my handy cam. I'm gonna do the wedding video. I'm a wedding videographer. And they were like, oh, really? And I was like, no, was I? No, I'd never done anything like that in my life. But I really wanted to go to West Africa because I was into the, the percussion and drums. I did my first trip, say, to Africa with that random person to their wedding and 
hardly filmed any of the ceremony, but filmed all the drumming and all the, all the stuff, all the cultural stuff that I was really into. So then that, I put that on YouTube and, you know, then people could see that, okay, I've been to West Africa. Then another guy asked me, did I want to go to Ghana? And, um, okay, he wasn't paying, but he was paying all my food and he was paying the flights. So suddenly I'm in Ghana in West Africa and I'm like getting fed and everything and I'm making this film. And at that point then, okay, you've been to West Africa twice. Then suddenly you might get a job in Ghana from another person because they've seen, oh yeah, Tom's been to that region, he knows about it. Well, I've never been to that region, but this guy has, so okay, I'll pay him to do a camera job out there. So, you know, I kind of pioneered those first couple of trips and then eventually, after a few, I'd start to get paid. And then people I just I got a reputation for a guy who would go anywhere. Everyone kind of knew how I wasn't married, I didn't have kids and I was... I would just say yes to pretty much anywhere. So I started going around and around until it got to about 50 odd countries. And unfortunately it's kind of flatlined a bit now because I just get a lot of repeats. People know that you know certain cultures and that you're connected there and then you'll just, I tend to get jobs back and forth there. I think there's a bit of a trend as well. Years ago, if you wanted a TV, British TV program done in another country, you're gonna send a British guy. Otherwise, God knows what might happen. You really couldn't trust the talent in the other countries. Whereas now with the Facebook and the Facebook groups and that type of thing, it's much easier for people if they've got a shoot in Germany to find an FS7 operator who lives in Leipzig. You know, you've got a, a one day, one interview to do in Leipzig. Does it really matter who the cameraman is? They've all got the same equipment stuff. It We'll just hire him. So I think that's happened as well. I might get less jobs abroad now because now because the internet, there's a better way to connect with people around the world. Yeah, you can see their, their previous work now, before it would have been literally, oh, you wanna see my show reel? Oh, well, I'm gonna have to post it to you because, I mean, before YouTube, let's, there were things like daily motions, there were other ways to get stuff up online, but it was so pixelated and mm. strange. And if you were an older cameraman at that point, you wouldn't really be tapped into that world because you would have been coming out of the film world and. This is why workshops are so important, and this is why mentoring is so important, and this is why it's so important to talk to other people, because you can learn from one another. You know, I might have made mistakes. I didn't need to make those mistakes. I could have been helped. You know, when I was in university, they gave me this guy, Chris Morris, who was my lecturer, and he was a god to me, that I could call if I was feeling emotional about a project, that like, he, he just had the answers for me. And that was great. And since I left him, it's been hard not having that mentor around. So hindsight is a brilliant thing. Now, in 2006 and seven, I wrote my dissertation about YouTube. And I said, YouTube will take over the world. It'll change the governments, it'll change everything. So I knew how powerful it was gonna be. I even wrote about vlogging. One of my things was about these new things, vloggers. Um, but then I started to get the BBC work and it's very interesting because it kind of touches upon the ego in some way because I was suddenly getting my £350 per day to work for the BBC and if I was meeting someone out in town, oh hi nice to meet you, what do you do? Oh, I'm a BBC cameraman. I felt good saying I'm a BBC cameraman. I grew up in a world in the 90s where there was no Netflix, there was no internet thing. It was just BBC was it. That that was top of the pops. That was the kids TV, but every Saturday you watched it. Television was just a huge part of our lives growing up in that era. And um, when I sat there in the lounge on a Friday night with my mum and dad, who are obsessed with television, who watch television for three, four hours a night, every night, my whole entire life, suddenly my name scrolled up, specialist camera. Tom Swindell, and it felt good. Whereas the YouTube was making my own films, a couple of hundred views, 100,000 views here and there if I'm lucky, but it didn't feel the same because that was establishment. I was making it, I was impressing the old people. And when you're growing up, it's really about impressing those older people. That's what you feel like you need to do. You're trying to get into that world of established people. Um, so I focused on that, but around 2013, 2012, a Spanish friend of mine said to me, 
bread for today, starvation for tomorrow. And I was like, oh, wow, what an interesting phrase. And he said it in Spanish. The, it's a Spanish phrase, right? Yeah. And um, it's a kind of socialist kind of phrase. And it's commenting on the type of work that I do. I might go out there and get my £500 a day to be a DOP. But once you've ate that bread, you're starving, you know? If I break my legs in a car accident tomorrow, it's completely and utterly game over for me. I've got no work. I will never get any more work again. Um, whereas if you set up your own business, then it's not only bread for today, starvation for tomorrow, because you start to build the bakery and then you can bake your own bread, you know? So it, with me, it's interesting how I started off on YouTube and then I gave up on it. Because at the time I was doing the TV programs and anything I had spare time to make on YouTube, I felt that, oh, it's not really good enough. It's not as good as this TV stuff I was doing where I was suddenly getting lights and big production going on. So I thought, oh, it'll be damaging. What if the TV people see it and it doesn't look good enough? Mm. Um, so I stopped uploading to there. But where would I be today if when all that BBC work was coming in, I kind of didn't go for it and I concentrated on said, no, I'm going to be an independent filmmaker and I push my own YouTube channel, I might be a millionaire by now. You never know. Maybe it would have all gone wrong. But, yeah, it's interesting as you get older, you start to think back, you have some regrets sometimes, or you start to try and analyse the past. What if, coulda, shoulda, woulda. Mm. I don't know. I think um, directing your own stuff, owning your own brand, for example, picking a theme and sticking with my own YouTube channel, that that's a great asset, and I would implore other people to go for that as an option working for other people's good but ultimately you're always chasing a carrot on a stick you know so save the frogs you know <laughs> um we, we have a slogan as they save the frogs they save the world we're going to try to catch the the frog what's truly important is actually storyline the subject story is king is what they say if you're the type of person who is good at finding out good ideas for documentaries and you're good at pitching them you're going to be more successful you could be someone like me who's really good at making interesting frames and interesting pictures but at the end of the day what's it worth it can't it's not a product on its own people won't watch a film because it has interesting imagery they'll watch it because of the storyline. So that's the aspect of filmmaking that's important. And that's the mainstream majority of the documentary film work. I'm kind of in a bit of a niche on the sideline. Now, it's not a bad thing because being in a niche and just doing the pretty side of the pictures actually helped me to get work. Cause I wasn't, you imagine if there's a thousand people running that way and you're going on a side path that way, that's similar direction, but slightly different. It had its advantages for a while, but um, my advice to like young people or people starting out would be be an ideas man or an ideas woman, because that's it's really a peer that will get you far in life in a sense of you could be as technical and amazing as, as you want. And the work is in having ideas and that's the work that you own more. Obviously, you could be just an aesthetic DOP and go into like your branded content and just do that. But for me, you end up in a world of filming cars and it just gets a bit funny, the advertising world. I just don't want to spend my life um, creating adverts, selling products to people. I, in documentary, I feel like I'm doing, giving society something that is worthy, you know, because it's a bridge of communication between different groups of society, different elements of society that helps educate people and enlightens people into others' perspectives. I'm interested in life, culture, and, and think, you know, I'm interested in like a certain bunch of people in the north of Thailand who have this religious festival based on ghosts and they all come out and drink this kind of like home brew and have these mad sculptures and they carry people and they play guitars and play some type of strange kind of blues, kind of psychedelic blues music. I mean, that's the type of thing I get interested in and I want to go there and make a film about it. My interest is really in life rather than in the kind of nuts and bolts of the filmmaking equipment. 
and that's what gives me style and attitude and um, you, you you get too technical about it or you love the kit too much you kind of lose you kind of lose your style really or you might find you're getting your style from Instagram because you're seeing all the latest camera bloggers are using this particular transition so you bang that all over yours or oh, they're all doing this whip up and down thing so I'll do my whip up and down thing you, you've got to be careful with that you're going to end up generic I've been shooting documentaries for so long now that it's very instinctual it's almost like someone riding a bicycle it's, I don't conscious it's, some, it's, it's almost not conscious because I just go into a room and I just rip it up and fold it up and put it into my camera and I just know how to do that. I mean, if it's this room, it's like wide from the corner, go outside through the window. It's, it's just this whole process that goes on for me to cover a scene. Um, I know how it's done because of the years of experience with the TV programs. They're so, you know, for example, I'm employed an FS7 operator for a job on Saturday. And um, I want someone who's done TV because people who've done TV have had to learn about sequences so they don't just get isolated shots, they really know about like a three shot sequence or a five shot sequence and how you, what needs to go with what, when you need your cutaways. Um, and that's the great thing about PDs actually, because they, they sit there in the edit, so they really thoroughly learn through badly shooting a scene and not having the coverage, they learn in the edit. Um, I still edit every now and again myself, just a couple of projects a year because I think if you become a DOP and you don't ever sit there in the edit, you can start to lose grip on what's required in the edit. Um, so yes, yeah, shooting in sequences is very, very important. Like a, like a mini storyboard in your head. Yeah. So things like non-sync wides and stuff like that, they're kind of, it's kind of a language that's been developed by cameramen and women o over the years. And it's different to the language of, people who've just done wedding videos and little corporate things and kind of worked outside of that television framework. So you can see the difference, yeah. Well, I'm still a musician of sorts, not a proper musician, because I'm a drummer who was kind of laughed at by proper musicians, but um, I play percussion, so rhythm's very important, integral part of my life every day. Um, I really wanted to do music more full time, but at the time I thought that it's either music or f film or music and I went down the film route so um, I do percussion because it's something you can just kind of pick up on the side and not have to put full-time dedication into. With music there's an inherent visual, okay? Um, if you think about music 400 years ago, if you wanted to hear some music you would have gone to see people performing music on instruments. You might have been outside a cathedral and you could hear the choir mm -hmm. But in general, you'd walk in and you'd see the choir. So there's always been a visual element. You'd see the people singing. You'd see the man playing the violin in the pub. After that, uh, live music, we started to develop music machines, like um, kind of early predecessors of the jukebox, that kind of thing. So you had the kind of music boxes, you know, that kids would uh, use for lullabies and that type of thing. That was the first automated music, in a sense. But you could still see... The music box in the room turning there was still a kind of crank system an inherent visual that went with the sound it wasn't until the kind of invention of vinyl records where suddenly music would be played on a gramophone and you'd hear the music but you couldn't see the band so there's been this kind of period of separation between imagery and music through the recorded music but i always felt very encouraged to represent the visual side of music so I was really inspired by live performances particularly I remember being around 18 and trying to decide what to do in my life and I was very taken back by footage of people like Bob Marley live in concert from the 70s things like Carla Santana's performance at Woodstock from 1969 and um, I thought god you know what if I can't be Carla Santana and I can't be Bob Marley I'd at least like to be that cameraman on stage next to them filming it. I thought that looks like a good job and it looks like an important job because here I am in 2001 and I'm watching this footage from the 60s and I'm having this great experience feeling like I'm at Woodstock or that I'm at 
this Bob Marley concert. Bob Marley's dead and he's some amazing prophet of music. I could listen to his music or I could watch him live in concert and that'll give me something else to the music. There's um, gesture in music that you don't hear, you see it. So I remember Bob Marley kind of pulling back from the mic and going like that and doing this kind of head shake. He kind of closed his eyes and you see his dreads kind of go and it was, um, it was kind of part of the music in a way. It wasn't audio, it was this visual but you kind of got this, it was like a little spiritual moment he was having, the kind of um, sweat and the wind and stuff. And um, yeah, that moment when I watched that, that made me think, yeah man, I should be here to represent the visual side of music. So I've tried to stay close to music as I could through my career. Television took me away from it. But luckily I've worked for like Warner Brothers and other big labels doing short music documentaries and uh, music videos. Music videos became massively important because they're crazy. BBC tripod, hold it for five seconds. You know, music video was like, take the lens off, shake the tripod with your hand, you know, like throw paint on the camera, you know, like it was just try anything, you know, rub grease on the lens, you know, so it was very experimental, which helped me develop a really exciting kind of vocabulary of camera moves. And then as you, years went on I'd end up using those techniques back into television documentaries to kind of spice them up a bit.